So what is the best Battlefield game? It's a tough question, I know, and it's one that raises a lot of debate, because I'm not so sure if there is a definitive best Battlefield game, outside of the one that I think you grew up with playing the most. For PC players, it's usually 1942 or Battlefield 2. For anyone who jumped into the series as it went mainstream, it usually seems to be 3. For newer players, the go-to is actually quite consistently Battlefield 1, although safe to say no one's favorite is 2042, or god forbid Hardline. It's interesting because I think every game, the good games at least, all have varying pros and cons. They aren't necessarily perfect games, and a lot of the enjoyment that comes from them is purely subjective. Being able to vibe in a pseudo World War I aesthetic on a premium modern AAA game, or a quaint World War II shooter from an older age of PC gaming. Battlefield players all seem to have their own personal preference, which is kind of neat. It's a series that has a lot of variety, and it's neat that every game has its own little community. People who love that game more than anything else. I enjoy 1. I even kind of enjoyed 3 for a little bit. But if I had to look back and pick a single Battlefield game that I genuinely love the most, that has my favorite combat, the most replayable maps, the best, it's Bad Company 2. <laughs> If I had to point to a small group of multiplayer FPS games that defined the generation I grew up in, people might be shocked to learn that Bad Company 2 is near the top of that list, up there with my all-time favorites. Its multiplayer was so fucking addicting that ever since its release, I've played and at least tried out every single Battlefield title that came after it, excluding only one. Yet despite having an enjoyable amount of time in other titles, I always found that enjoyment just kind of fleeting. Like I've never been compelled to revisit 3. I've never had a desire to even pick up 4 again, or god forbid Hardline. Even Battlefield 1, a game that I thoroughly enjoyed, and a game that I attribute to helping me get through a couple years of college. Today, I can only muster up playing one or two matches before uninstalling. Yet Bad Company 2, it has been installed on my computer for years, and I regularly return to the dusty roads of Erica Harbor, or the sweaty jungles of Valparaiso, and I always manage to get hooked back into it. And what's even funnier is I know I'm not alone either. Bad Company 2 routinely tops lists of the community's favorite Battlefield game. Hell, it's mine! So I decided to take a deep dive into the love fans have for this game, by asking them myself. I asked my own community to describe their favorite Battlefield title without giving away the fact that I was specifically looking for Bad Company 2. I also scoured the web looking through forums and threads just to get a variety of opinions to know why people really love this game. I wanted to see if I could summarize the love people have for Bad Company 2. And luckily for me, I think I've kinda narrowed it down. So I should specify, this won't be a full-fledged review. It's more about my thoughts on the game and the things I love about it. I should also mention that I'm barely going to touch the campaign. My memories with Battlefield are in multiplayer, so if you were here for that, well, sorry. So let's sit back, relax, and dive into Bad Company 2. Oh, EA shutting it down. Oh, the game gets delisted later this month. Oh, the server shut down in December. Oh. To talk about Bad Company 2, you really can't talk about it in a bubble. Its death is right on the horizon. That's pretty much why I made this video as fast as I could. And it's also why I can't really make an objective review. Like seriously, how can you? This game is going to be dead by the end of the year. So before this game receives a traditional EA send off, let's talk about Bad Company 2 and why it was created in the first place, which is going to require us to talk a lot about Battlefield history, because we need to recap how DICE accidentally made their best game ever. So let's begin. Today we think of Battlefield as a large multi-platform AAA juggernaut competing with the likes of Call of Duty, but back in the day it was a smaller, way more niche PC exclusive whose only comparable competition probably would have been Planetside 1. They were complex and filled to the brim with mechanics tied together in an old engine being stretched to the breaking point. The old Refractor era Battlefield games are legendary, but they weren't without their share of jank. 
hard to approach gameplay, odd weapon balancing and accuracy, vehicles that were hard to master, and overall a massive hardcore PC audience who loved every bit of it. It all screams 2000s PC gaming, which I'm not saying is a bad thing. Battlefield 2 especially, whose modding scene eventually led to a game like Squad. It was a very different beast than it is today, with a vastly different community. Battlefield basically used to be a bridge between shit like Medal of Honor, Allied Assault, and fucking Arma. Early Battlefield was definitely a successful series. Not AAA, but definitely carving out its own little niche. For a time. The original games, 1942, Battlefield 2, and even in Vietnam, all sold pretty well. Battlefield 2 especially was a turning point for the series, considering how much it refined the core mechanics of its predecessors. Not to mention how it solidified Battlefield's setting in modern warfare. But after it, DICE seemingly didn't really know what direction to take the franchise in. So they began to experiment. Battlefield 2 had a quote-unquote spin-off made just for consoles, in the form of Battlefield 2 Modern Combat, which has little to do with the game it was based on, running on a completely different engine with very different gameplay and a very different murky brown aesthetic and atmosphere. It was a far cry from its PC big brother, yet it sold well. People don't really acknowledge this game, but I think it's worth looking at simply because I think this is where DICE figured out that maybe Battlefield can make the leap to the console, if given at least another try. Meanwhile, back on the PC, 2142 was rolled out as DICE's first attempt into a sci-fi Battlefield game, an attempt the likes of which hasn't been made again. Despite it following up Battlefield 2 in gameplay, mechanics, game modes, and maps, 2142, best as the community can tell, was a bit of a commercial flop. Info is very spotty at best. We do know for a fact what the sales numbers for the original games were, thanks to an official DICE interim report from 2006. But how many copies this game itself sold is a little finished. Lower estimates place it at around a couple hundred thousand copies, although considering how the game sold at least 100k in the UK, I imagine the sales numbers are definitely significantly higher, but clearly nowhere near compared to 2 or 1942. It also had a very buggy rough launch, something that would become a recurring staple of DICE's later entries, and despite its eventual patches and warm player reception, 2142 remains an unpopular title among the old Battlefield fanbase. There's a reason why it's never gotten a proper sequel. During 2142's development was also when EA stepped in to acquire DICE. This coupled with 2142's lackluster commercial success, a big shift was made to bring Battlefield into the next generation of hardware. Cutting edge graphics, player accessibility, and full releases on consoles. Bad Company 1 was the second console spinoff for the series, running on a completely different engine with very different gameplay and a very different murky brown aesthetic and atmosphere. It was a far cry from its PC big brother, yet it sold well. Hey, wait a minute. Mad Company 1 was made with the explicit purpose of simplifying the Battlefield experience while still retaining its core. Mostly. The refactor engine was completely dropped by this point, in favor of DICE's brand new secret weapon, Frostbite. An engine built from the ground up for Bad Company. It had high fidelity models, textures, and lighting, along with destructible buildings and scenery. Because as innovative as Frostbite was, I think people overlook why it was even made in the first place. It wasn't just to look pretty or to push the bar in technical prowess. It was to be optimized from the ground up to run on weaker console hardware and run well while doing it. And this kind of paid off with Bad Company 1, with sales rivaling its mainline PC counterparts. Its gameplay was streamlined but also polished, with guns feeling feeling accurate and movement feeling fast and solid. It had a completely different feeling to that, especially of Battlefield 2. Bad Company simplified a lot of its core Battlefield mechanics just to make its playability even more approachable for new players. Rush, along with the maps that it was made for, streamlined the game by turning the level into essentially a massive corridor, as opposed to the large and scattered territory of, say, Battlefield 2's Conquest. It took the limited players and packed them tightly into a narrow hotspot. I'll talk a little more about this design once we get into Bad Company. Company 2. Bad Company 1 was and remains a solid little entry, with a lovable campaign and an admirable attempt at multiplayer. It's fascinating what was going on with Battlefield at this time. Battlefield 1943 famously came into existence from DICE developers playing around in Frostbite by rebuilding Wake Island, only to end up getting addicted to playing it themselves. On the PC, EA was testing the waters with live service games, Battlefield Heroes and Battlefield Play for Free. Not that there's a lot I can say about them. They are free to play, to a fucking monstrous degree as well. Either way, these console-only releases and cheap free-to-play shit were definitely souring things with the old-school PC Battlefield crowd, especially the Battlefield 2 community. So a proper sequel, the eventual Battlefield 3, would be DICE's eventual goal, but not before making what they thought was just a mere stepping stone to get there. 
Bad Company 2. Released in 2010, this time finally to PC as well as Xbox 360 and PS3, Bad Company 2 was a fucking massive and downright shocking success. I'm talking about people who would never have touched a Battlefield game were now overnight fans. Hell, that's what happened to me. And since Bad Company 2, this series has just continued to chug along, releasing AAA game after AAA game. This month, EA is going to pull this game from digital stores, along with 1943 and Bad Company 1. And then, in December, these games will shut down forever. So, I kind of want to talk about this game, at least before it officially died. So you might wonder, what's so good about Bad Company 2? Why is it that almost 13 years later there are still people who love and adore this game, even over its sequels? Well, despite being a huge fan of Bad Company 2 itself, even I struggled to find the right words to describe why this game resonates with me. Way more than any other Battlefield title. And that's what made me look externally. Why not ask the community? As I said, I looked around multiple websites, even asked my own subscribers, just to see of the people who liked this game, what about it specifically hooked them? And after some extensive searching and reading many, many responses, I've definitely narrowed it down. Class balance and gunplay, fun level layouts and destructible environments, as well as sound design, graphics, and just simple creative touches. Oh, also Vietnam too. So is Bad Company 2 perfect? Yes. Okay, obviously not, it's got its flaws, but I think the charm of this game really elevates it to a level that not many Battlefield games reach for me. Is it nostalgia? Eh, probably. But looking more in depth into it, it's clear that there are objective game decisions that make Bad Company 2 a tier above the rest. So let's jump right into it. Ow. Long before EA even announced that they were shutting down this game, Bad Company 2 was pretty much already on life support. At some point, the EA servers started acting, how should I say, uh, very fucky with this game. To this day, whenever you log in, there is a dice roll, no pun intended, as to whether or not you'll even be logged in at all. Seriously, the network isn't down, you aren't supposed to wait. When you fail a login, you are supposed to retry over, and over, and over, and over, until you finally get in. See, there we go. Which does happen eventually, but this already is a huge filter to most people. I know for a fact that your average normie will see this pop up and go, Oh, Bad Company 2 no longer works. All right, I'll peace out. No, it's still up. Well, for now it is, but you can still play it, and the servers are still up. And even then, I know this isn't guaranteed. I know plenty of people who still can't log into the game, usually due to a broken account or a soldier that they can no longer access. Basically, it's a coin flip as to whether or not this game is playable for you. And you are only really guaranteed full playability if you manage to register a soldier at least more than a few years ago. Once you get in though, you now have access to the server browser. You're gonna need it. And that's not to say this game works when you're finally in a match. Oh, trust me, there is more to this game's bugginess than networking issues. But hey, that's what you get when you play a Battlefield game that's over 13 years old that the developer wants to fucking kill. So you kinda just gotta roll with the punches. Anyway, into the actual gameplay. Just like any Battlefield game, you see four classes to choose from. Assault, Engineer, Medic, and Recon. Assault is self-explanatory. This class is all about infantry combat, with access to some devastating assault rifles. It also has access to ammo crates, which means that this class is kind of self-sustaining. Every Battlefield game has one OP class, and in Bad Company 2, it's Assault. Also, fun fact, I'm a dirty, sweaty Assault player. But it doesn't ruin the game. At least I don't think so. I might be biased, who knows. I'll get into that more in a little bit. Engineer is the vehicle class, whether it's repairing them or destroying them. They have access to SMGs and all kinds of explosives, which also make them very good for taking on enemies at close range. Medics are interesting here. They have the usual medic shtick. They got health packs, they can revive allies. But here, their main weapons are LMGs. So these guys are great at being in the middle of the action among teammates and suppressing enemies and keeping the squad alive. Raycon. They're mostly snipers, although with things like C4 and mortars, they make very good saboteur classes too. Although, if anything, the role of a recon player is often to counter snipe other enemy recon players, so the class kind of cancels itself out. While Battlefield has kept a four class structure, the exact classes have shifted and changed. 
Following this game, the Assault and Medic class were just outright swapped in their class abilities, Assault being given LMGs and renamed Support, with Medic being given medium range Assault Rifles and being renamed as Assault. Yeah, it's a little confusing. Meanwhile, in later games, namely Battlefield 1, the Engineer class itself was removed entirely, only being playable if you managed to spawn in a vehicle. Its SMGs and explosives were then given to the Assault class, with that Assault class's former Assault Rifles and Medical abilities given to the new Medic class. So yeah, Assault went from having rifles and ammo packs, to rifles and med packs, to SMGs and nothing. Yeah. Was this a good choice or not? Uh, I'd say yes and no. For starters, fuck support class. Especially in one. Let me tell you, as someone who regularly played support, they were fucking broken. Long range, highly accurate LMGs with self-sustaining ammo kits. Medic, meanwhile, was completely useless in one, with its weapons being noticeably mediocre compared to other classes. At least in the early game. And it's why you never really saw a lot of players using Medic outside of the one guy who really, really loved being a team player. So, sure. Bad Company 2 doesn't have the best class structure. Assault is massively overpowered at medium range, and with his ammo pack he can constantly refill. However, this was always countered by the slow healing rate, where, say after encountering someone bringing him to near death, he would then have to retreat back to his squad, or risk getting one-shotted by the next person he saw. It wasn't perfect, a good player could hide, heal up, and run back out there, but it prevented the Assault class from being a one-stop wrecking crew. Plus his ammo kit was a really valuable tool for the rest of his teammates giving Assault a reason to stick with his squad. Medic, meanwhile, was great at holding an area. Holding down an objective, keeping an area clear of enemies. That LMG has a massive magazine size, meaning that you can hold down the trigger for a long time. Combine that with a med kit or a revive, and a single medic can keep his whole squad alive for a match, not running up ahead blindly with an assault rifle. I do understand why they swapped the assault and medic class, but I think Bad Company's class structure at least deserves a second look for veteran fans, given just how enjoyable and surprisingly balance the game feels to this day. No matter what class you are in this game, you feel like you have plenty of agency in supporting your squad or dealing with enemies. A final thing I want to mention in regard with classes might actually tie in with the graphics, but readability here is shockingly great. It's something that I literally never noticed until swapping to another Battlefield game. In fact, let's look at one. 2042, which at this point is like picking on a little kid. Look at this person right here. What class are they? What about him? Or what about her? What about this guy? Gosh, what class could she possibly be? Do you see a problem yet? This itself is the result of many other, far worse game mechanics, resulting in class structures becoming a joke, where the need for an in-depth progression system and unlocks has resulted in a game where the lines between different classes start to blur. I especially blame Battlefield 4 for this, with its sheer number of multi-role guns that water down class uniqueness. So the identifying of a soldier and their class has become less important over time, given how in regards to weaponry, they all probably have the same gun. And with Battlefield 5 came horrific cosmetics that ruined any sense of faction unity that the series once had. Battlefield 1 was a welcomed exception to this, with classes restricted to gun types, also having somewhat distinct outfits and appearances for each role, across every faction. So, good job Battlefield 1, you at least got that right. With Bad Company 2, it's kind of incredible how visually distinct each class is to one another. Like, it's something I don't even consider with other Battlefields. But here, it's literally a subconscious element of the gameplay. Assault. He's a masked soldier with a very streamlined profile. Engineer. He's got a similar profile, although he has a unique headpiece, either a helmet or a balaclava. And they also have their big chunky rocket launchers that give them a distinct silhouette. The medic has a bulky jacket with a visible face, either a cap or a beret. And lastly, Recon, he's the guy in the ghillie suit. There's definitely something to be said about readability in a game, especially in a class-based shooter. And Bad Company 2 is one of the few games in the series, yes, even compared to the ones that came before it, where all the classes were so visually distinct that any player can discern a soldier at a quick glance. Where am I going with this? Well, I just think it's neat that Bad Company 2 utilized a surprising amount of depth and solid mechanics in what was, to them, a simple experimental console game. Because when I think people talk about how much they like the classes in Bad Company 2, they aren't really referring to specific abilities or perks or roles. Instead, it's the fact that the game itself had a remarkable level of balance, and this leads us nicely into gunplay. The combat is pretty damn good. 
For whatever reason, Bad Company 2 is regarded by many fans as having the most fun combat in the series. Yeah, I can't disagree. There's something about it. Guns just feel weightier and more impactful. The TTK here is also my favorite in any Battlefield game. Not ridiculously long like in some games, but also not stupidly fast like in a few others. Just kind of the right balance. Enough where you can easily put down one or two enemies if you have to drop on them. But go in recklessly without thinking and you'll find yourself quickly outmatched by a player who's a little more skilled than you are. There's an amazing dance here where enemies take just the right amount of damage that forces you to fully commit or back the fuck up. Or if you're too risky and win a gunfight, now your health is low. And because this ain't Call of Duty, you are now vulnerable to any other enemy in the area. Because, yeah, some of the guns are massively bullshit. The assault rifles are OP. The SMGs are fucking annoying. The M95 is pure, overpowered, amazing trash. And I love it so much. It creates this sort of balancing act. Like a guy with the M416 with Magnum ammo and ACOG sight who is playing this game like COD, he might get a good killing spree, but he's fucking screwed if he gets too close to an engineer, whose SMG can kick his ass at point blank range. An LMG has such a large magazine that you can hold down the trigger and not worry about having to reload, so medics can hold down any point they want. And snipers are perfect for putting an end to campers, which itself becomes a counter to other snipers. Cause guess what? You wanna be a sneaky sniper? boy on Erica Harbor? Well hope you're prepared to deal with a half dozen enemy recon players on the other side of the map. Each weapon's bullshit here is kind of balanced by every other weapon's bullshit, which makes it fun to play and try out each class and their varying weapons. Because ultimately, I think the reason the guns here feel so nice to use is that Bad Company 2 has a limited arsenal, which ends up being a blessing. Every single gun, aside from a few exceptions, has a good use to it. And since there were less weapons to playtest, DICE clearly had an easier time balancing them. The Engineer definitely has the weakest roster since the SMGs all mostly have the same role, but other gun types? Assault rifles have a huge variety, some are clearly made for long range, some are made for medium range with a high rate of fire and spray and prey, others are very short range with massive magazine counts. Even with snipers and LMGs, an LMG can go from a short range suppression gun that kicks like a mule to something that's built for longer range at the expense of damage. Hell, choosing a sniper for the recon roll can practically change your play strategy entirely. Heavy damage Bolt action rifles have lots of damage, but they require two hits on a body shot, made complicated by the fact that you have to unscope to pull the bolt back, which could lose your target, giving them a chance to escape. You could also swap for a less powerful semi-auto rifle, or you could choose the VSS and go in for a long range automatic fire. All the guns feel so good to use. It's one of the few games where you will be constantly shuffling between loadouts within a match. And combine that with the specializations and it gives just enough layer of depth to the combat. Depending on what attachments or buffs that you have for your gun will determine your playstyle. It's definitely something I think back to when I look at Battlefield 4's progression system. Where there are way too many fucking guns. And a lot of them are just multi-class too. So it blends together to the point where someone picks their favorite gun and just sticks with it. Again, Bad Company 2 has such a nice little arsenal. Hell, even the starting guns that you get in the early levels are still viable weapons. Also, the XM8 is the coolest gun that never was. I just love the handful of games that actually had it, thinking that it would eventually replace the M4. Godspeed, XM8. You'll live long in our memories. There's another unique thing about Bad Company 2 that, in making this video, definitely solidified itself for me. For the longest time, I had a love of this game's overall presentation. But one aspect in particular, something that Bad Company 2 had, but the other games never really did it for me. Of course, I sometimes thought I was crazy. Maybe I did just imagine it. Maybe I dreamed it up, and I was wrong about it. But upon binging this game once more, as well as asking and hearing from plenty of other people, I can safely say that I am not alone in agreeing that Bad Company 2, out of all the other Battlefield games, has the best soundscape.
It's something I want to say I noticed as far back as Battlefield 3. Especially in the lead up to that game, where DICE were going into detail about how each gun sounded super realistic and immersive. Which was a neat idea. I do respect the aim for authenticity, and yes, I do recognize that in real life, guns are ear-piercing shockwaves that are hard to properly capture in a simple video game's dot flax sound effect. But I'll be fully honest, Battlefield 3, and by extension Battlefield 4's guns, all just sound too weak to me. Meanwhile, sharply contrast it with Bad Company 2, and it is night and day. Yeah, it's no contest. I think 3's problem, and especially 4, is that just with the multitude of weapons, they all sort of blend together in these weak sounding pea shooters. While in Bad Company 2, the game gave every single gun an extra boost. Not only do they all sound distinct, but they all sound fucking powerful. Is it realistic for a rifle to sound like a minigun? Nope, but it is way more pleasant to the ears. Outside of guns, the game's sound design is often fondly remembered by players. The intense distress screams and shoutings of your teammates, or the disembodied announcer, both in English and in Russian. Combined with the heavy impact of vehicles, the cracking of distant sniper fire, and the screams of nearby enemies, Bad Company 2 remains one of the best sounding multiplayer games I have ever played. And a special mention should go to the music, which I'll tie in with Bad Company 1 as well, because both of these games, for the faults of their campaign, have stellar orchestral soundtracks. I can literally transport myself into a particular multiplayer map, based entirely off of the loading screen music. And hey, what a segue! Like I mentioned earlier when talking about Bad Company 1, DICE's approach to the limited player counts of these games was to funnel players into a smaller and more frantic map. Rush helps facilitate this, forcing players into two capture points that need to be destroyed or protected. So the lower player count is all forced into essentially a corridor, which also helps create a front line between either side. Unlike an open conquest map where teams can attack from anywhere. While I love Bad Company 2, I'll be the first person to admit, it has its share of bad maps. Valparaiso has horrible checkpoints, White Pass is way too cramped and chaotic, Heavy Metal is stupidly open and empty. Like every battlefield, it's got its share of bad maps. However, what's good here is very good. Maps always have multiple routes. Teams are always split into lanes to fight on. There's a reason why Erica Harbor is still a beloved map 13 years later. It's because its layout allows for multiple firefights within massive battles. The developers use the game's smaller player count to their advantage, being able to easily account for where squads would naturally go towards, and balance accordingly. It's what makes these firefights more engaging. You aren't just fighting the enemy team, you're fighting the guys charging up the middle, or you're fighting the snipers up on the hill, or the squad trying to sneak and flank your team. This lower player count also gives squads way more influence. The standard battlefield count is 64, and in 2042 they tried to raise it to 128, which is fucking stupid if you ask me. Battlefield isn't planet side, and judging by that game's reception, maybe 100 plus players wasn't a smart idea, because you're stuck entirely at the whims of the team as a collective. Losing a match in those games suck, because you know there's no recovery. No matter how much heavy lifting multiple squads do, they're always dragged down by their shitty teammates. 
In Bad Company 2, a good squad can swing an entire match. My fondest memories of this game involve me and a squad sneaking past enemy lines and causing all kinds of mayhem. Killing camping snipers, destroying enemies camping the MCOM, or in Conquest capturing points. Not only can a single squad shift the turn of a match, but they can also force people out of a stalemate, forcing them to run back to a capture point that is undefended, or to run back to the MCOM to defuse it. The map design, while basic and simple, really helps encourage that but especially through its sandbox. Which, okay, we need to talk about destructibility. <laughs> Fucking awesome. This game is almost 13 years old, yet it still has some of the best dynamic destruction out of any Battlefield game. Like, seriously, this was the last game where you could level every single building on the map. The destructibility was a huge focus point of Frostbite, and you can tell it's what the devs poured a ton of work into. I think what makes it amazing is how effortless it is during multiplayer. Fucking Battlefield 4 had scripted destruction moments, and even those were glitching out constantly on multiplayer servers. Yet somehow, Bat Company 2, in the eve of its destruction, still doesn't have any of that. And the destruction has a tactical purpose. You need to break through doors, you need to blow through walls. If an enemy is tucked away in a building, just destroy the building. Problem solved. Also, there is a subsect of people who really, really don't like Bad Company's destruction. To which I think most of them are the types of players who love camping in a corner the entire match just to level up by themselves. I'm still annoyed by the later games for how little destruction they offered. Way too many walls and buildings that can't be blown up or destroyed. That shit would not fly in Bad Company 2. If you are sniping out from a window, I'm going to shove a 40mm right through your drywall. Sorry. And you can complain about it all you want. You can be mad that this game lets you destroy buildings and create holes to change the map flow and thus makes it feel less competitive. You can argue that Bad Company 2's destruction makes the game too unpredictable. But you know what? I don't care. <laughs> I like destruction, because it forces enemies to move and relocate. It keeps the battlefield unpredictable and penalizes people for being too reliant on a particular piece of cover or hiding spot. It spices up the gameplay, and its absence from future battlefield games has created a noticeable lack of quality in certain maps. Imagine every game following this, those really shitty maps with choke points and indestructible walls, and now imagine how cathartic it'd be to be able to blast a hole in that very wall and flank the enemies from behind. Hey, did you know that there's also no prone in this game? Which some people might think is an oversight, but I disagree. It's a clear design choice, and it kind of works here. Because the problem with prone is that players are incentivized to use it to get out of trouble, to hide behind a rock or at the top of a hill, and to take pot shots or snipe from across the map. With only your head poking out, it's really unfair for players who don't have the drop on you. Which is why things like sniper glare was even added in the first place. The problem with prone is that it encourages camping and hiding, something that should be saved for the recon class. Not everyone. With a lack of prone, you can only crouch, which still hides you, but helps you with player visibility. You can't simply make yourself disappear anymore. Instead, you're right out in the open with a big juicy hitbox. How should you respond? Well, relocate of course. Run. Hide. Move. Get to another position. Bad Company's core design philosophy is to be on the move, and destructible buildings are merely in addition to that. You simply can't hide behind a wall if that wall can be blown up at any moment. It's a game where you have to be flexible and mobile, switching positions, moving your attacker to fence position, and swapping tactics on the fly. If that building you and your friends were using to hold the objective just collapsed, well you better think fast on where to move next. That's why I think people who criticize the destruction in Bad Company 2 kinda have no idea what they're talking about about because destructibility wasn't just technically impressive, it was mechanically and strategically impressive as well. And the fact that the later Battlefield games don't have it is a major downgrade. Also, man, speaking of technically impressive, this game still looks fucking beautiful. It wasn't the first Battlefield game running on Frostbite, but it was the first Frostbite game to be ported over to PC. And Fuck me, it still looks great. Lighting is amazing, levels are detailed, textures and models have aged very well. The game definitely goes for a less harsh color tone, as opposed to Bad Company 1. Unlike in that game, here all the colors are allowed to pop more, so the image has a slightly more clear look to it. When I first played it, I just remember being completely blown away by the lighting. The bloom can be a little much, which is the only thing that slightly dates this game, but otherwise, I think this game is downright beautiful. And the only real issue I have is with the bad aliasing. 
This was also the last Battlefield game where I don't feel sick playing it. What do I mean by that? Well, promptly following Bad Company 2, Battlefield 3 came out. And if there's one thing I remember about that game, it was, wow, this game is blue and brown and only those colors. This was something way too many games were doing at the time, smearing their cameras in a desaturated color filter. I think it was to look more realistic. I don't know. I've been outside on a sunny day. I know what color the sky is. To me, this just feels like I'm playing the game with malaria or something. It just looks gross. I know some people say they don't really notice things like color grading or color filters in movies or games, to which I have to ask, really? Do you not notice anything wrong with this image? It's okay if you're colorblind. It's hilarious though because the color filter was so bad that people went in to mod the game just to look saturated. Which is a shame. I think Battlefield 2, despite that game's dated graphics, has a really beautiful and vibrant color temperature that just makes every level in that game pop. In 3, they just end up blending together into a murky pool of blue and brown. Same goes for 4, just too much blue. Ugh. It's ironic because both of these games were hailed as being super realistic and amazing graphics wise. Yet you revisit them now, I would go so far as to say Bad Company 2 looks far more appealing than either of them combined. Now Battlefield 1 and 5 did change it up by bringing back color to the game, thank god. And I do find 1 to be very pretty. Although, now it has the problem of lighting being way too overexposed and contrasty. Some maps were fucking killed by this bad lighting system, with how dark certain rooms and corridors were. Seriously, what happened with making your lighting believable? I was totally fine with Bad Company 2's colorful, yet not overblown color palette. But yeah, this was the last Battlefield game where I didn't feel like getting a headache every 5 minutes. Also, another thing I need to mention because people kept bringing it up, the campaign. I sadly don't have a lot to say about it. I tried to revisit Bad Company 2's campaign, and Bad Company 1's as well. And let me say, uh, I don't really enjoy them. The first game is kind of interesting. The map is a little more open and a little more sandboxy, but it's still not that good. 2 went in a completely different direction and made the game far more linear and scripted. It was a very standard military FPS for the time. Not a lot of content, very linear, and decent production value, although it was dwarfed by Call of Duties. But of course, I keep hearing people who say they love the campaigns, which I'm going out on a limb here. I think it is entirely due to the characters, who, I must admit, are all quite charming. Ooh, how about that? Oh, RPG! RPG! Yeah, I saw it! If there's one positive I can give either game, it's that I like how simple and kind of lighthearted the story is. It doesn't take itself too seriously, and it's just a fun, adventurous romp across a military war zone. The game understands how silly a massive conventional war with Russia would be. It just accepts that and moves on. The first game itself had a plot ripped straight out of Kelly's Heroes, and that should paint a good picture of what these games were about. Mostly the misadventures of Bad Company as they stumble their way through a much larger war. And that's about the sum of it, I'm afraid. If it weren't for the characters, I literally would have forgotten the single player. Aside from that, I do think the single player levels look very nice graphically. If anything, Bad Company 2's campaign serves as a tech demo to show what Frostbite is capable of. But yeah, there's barely any meat here. Not enough to keep me playing. Oh yeah, people also love Vietnam. I'll make this quick because this video is getting way too long, and this is about the last thing I need to bring up with Bad Company 2. Vietnam. Coming out of the fucking blue, the Vietnam expansion was a shock to fans. A return to an era that hadn't been seen since 2004, with all the M16s, Hueys, and hot dense jungles that you could ask for. It was definitely weird bringing it to Bad Company 2, as with just a little more content, DICE totally could have made it as a small standalone, similar to 1943. However, the game feels just identical to the base game, and at times feels nothing more than a reskin. A very polished and very well done reskin, of course, but just a reskin. It's very clearly just Bad Company 2 in a new coat of paint, which probably to die-hard Battlefield Vietnam fans definitely lacked its complexities. I would love to have seen DICE try and re-implement a style of asymmetrical warfare, giving the Americans technological superiority and vehicles, and with the Viet Cong getting less high-tech and hand-me-down Soviet guns and bombs, but with a home-field map advantage, like with traps, tunnels, and mobility. 
I guess in the end, I just wanted a Battlefield Vietnam 2, which is not what this expansion is trying to be. It's trying to be a fun $15 DLC to an already great game. So for that, I think it does a pretty good job. Now, the only problem I really have with this DLC is the horrible color tinting, where this game seems to carry over the dark blue color filter that would later become part of the series. Aside from that though, I actually find this mode really fun to play. The smaller arsenal means that all guns are uniquely balanced. Less specializations means a more even playing field, making firefights more intense. If anything, Vietnam is a testament to how good Bad Company 2's core design was, because you can strip it down to its complete bare bones core, yet it is still an immensely engaging multiplayer. M16s and AKs have a great impact, grenade launchers are a wonderful inclusion to the sandbox, Uzis and MAC-10s are fun to use, LMGs, mainly the M16s, feel heavenly to wield. Snipers are fun as always, and the M1 is God's greatest gift onto this earth, which thanks to its stopping power and beautiful sound effects, I completely fell in love with, to the point where I regularly use it in the base game. I think that this simple expansion is kind of overlooked for why people like it so much. Cause sure, it's not very deep. However, the thing that makes it unique is that it was a fun, creative, little silly idea that stemmed probably from a small group of developers who ran with it so much that they decided to make it into a full package, and it was only $15. The Vietnam expansion was a microcosm of DICE as a whole, a studio that would take its small little ideas, experimental and weird, and try to expand upon them in their own games. Games like Battlefield 2, 2142, 1943, and Bad Company all existed because of a clear desire to try something new and venture out of their comfort zone, which overall resulted in a more varied but enjoyable franchise. Battlefield 2 especially, that game literally would not have existed without the modding scene. If you have played a Battlefield game that has had the following, a modern war aesthetic, commander mode, or even fucking squads, yeah, that only exists because of modders. That only exists because somewhere out there, a group of modders helped influence DICE in making that design decision. I actually mentioned the fact that thanks to Battlefield 3's awful color grading, people went so far as to make a mod to resaturate colors into the game. But what did 2011 era DICE and EA do? They took it down, and they banned players from using it, saying that they were hacking. If there was a clear divide between the old DICE and current DICE, I think Bad Company 2 is that line. It is the last game where it felt like they truly cared, not just about their games, but about the people who played them. Because from here on out, with every game, even Battlefield 1, which I adore parts of, still have that bland corporate feeling to them. You could feel the committee thinking. There's a funny quote that people love to bring up. DICE themselves have admitted that they don't understand why people love Bad Company 2 that the reason there hasn't been a Bad Company 3 is because they themselves don't even understand why 2 resonated with people the way it did. It's a quote that a lot of people bring up just to chuckle about in regards to Bad Company 2. They love to laugh and say that maybe Bad Company was an anomaly. But I think this quote speaks to a larger issue, something that a lot of people overlook. That being DICE itself. The point of this quote shouldn't be the fact that Bad Company 2 is this completely mystical, unapproachable game that no one knows why it was good. Rather, the point should be the fact that DICE don't fucking understand what makes good game design. A game that's as fun as enjoyable as Bad Company 2, with all of its many clear design choices and presentation, is something a studio like Modern DICE can't even comprehend. It's sad, and judging by how DICE is by their last few games, I think this idea rings all the more true. And, uh, that takes us to today, where Bad Company 2 is being marched right into its grave. At the end of this year, Bad Company 1, 2, and 1943 are all getting their servers shut down. Meanwhile, in a matter of days as I write this fucking video, on April 28th, the games will be delisted. Mainly Bad Company 2 from all digital storefronts. Christ, I know EA killing games isn't anything new, but it's still fucking insane. I think this stands out to me because these were games that I legitimately loved. I didn't play Bad Company 1, but you bet your ass I played 1943. Hell, Bad Company 2 on PC can and likely will survive thanks to mods, but not 1943. That game has its days fucking numbered. I'm not exactly sure what the point of this video was. Just a final chance to talk about a game that I love that's about to die? I don't know. I do know that EA's treatment of their older games is beyond disgraceful. Most companies would be so grateful to have a massive back catalog of beloved titles like Battlefield has, but with how EA treats it, it's like they see it as just extra baggage to get rid of. 
But yeah, once the game gets delisted from Steam, that'll definitely mark a turning point. Because sure, diehard fans like me are willing to jump through the hoops of downloading mods and third-party clients just to play our beloved games, but not Joe Schmo. Up until now, someone could theoretically buy the game, log into their EA account, and immediately hop into multiplayer, networking glitches aside. But now? <laughs> Forget it. Also, it's clear that EA is doing this as a thinly veiled attempt to lure people to their new game. Battlefield Portal is their brand new gimmick, and thanks to 2042's plummeting failure, you know for a fact that they have every incentive to slowly shut down every single old game, until only their current one remains. Hey, how else are you going to sell those microtransactions? To a person looking at Battlefield today, it might be hard to give the old entries a fair try. Especially with massive modern titles all desperate for your attention. It's easy to just stick with the newest game, to just jump on the bandwagon and play the latest junk that EA is selling. Yet I wish more people were willing to dip outside of their comfort zone, to maybe go back and revisit a title that they missed out on. Right now, there's definitely a gap for Battlefield fans. Its latest two entries were disappointments. I know there are people who are craving that Battlefield goodness. So I say to them, if you want to enjoy a Battlefield in a pure, even maybe more simpler form, without all those unnecessary additions and microtransactions, then you might be pleasantly surprised at Bad Company 2. Because behind its rough edges, there is a real lovable game here. One that has charm, style, and amazing gameplay to back all of it up. Bad Company 2 will always stick with me. Even as the server shut down, I am ready to make the jump to third-party clients. I did the same for Battlefield 2. I'll do the same here. No matter how hard EA tries, I will still enjoy my older games. Because this is one that I utterly adore. It's beautiful maps, it's hectic combat, it's a wonderful atmosphere and tone. Because yes, you can try and convince me that later titles have improved upon Bad Company's formula, and in some cases I'd agree with you. But at the end of the day, I am not in a rush to play Battlefield 3 or 4, or even 1. I have no intention of playing 5 in 2042. I really, really don't care about them. But for Bad Company 2, so long as there's enough people willing to play it, I will always find myself coming back to it. Because Bad Company 2 is just stupidly fun.